Star Wars Outlaws está chegando aí, né? Mês que vem o jogo já vai estar disponível pra gente poder jogar, gravar, fazer conteúdo, né? Ver qual é que é e se realmente vai funcionar um mundo aberto dentro da franquia, né? Esse jogo, ele tá sendo muito hypado por conta dessa proposta. É o primeiro jogo lançado da saga Star Wars em um mundo aberto, né? E quem tá fazendo é o pessoal da Massive Entertainment, né? Subsidiária, se eu não me engano, da Ubisoft, né? Se eu não me engano, não. É da Ubisoft. E a IGN tá fazendo uma cobertura enorme do game, trazendo um monte de coisa. Eu sei que eu tô atrasado pra caramba com esse jogo aqui no canal, mas eu gosto de Star Wars e faz tempo que eu quero dar uma olhada nesses conteúdos mais a fundo. Essa semana eles lançaram um vídeo bem extenso, hoje lançaram outro, eu quero estar tá vendo os dois. E como sempre, né? Toda vez que eu vou ver um conteúdo novo, eu falo, putz, por que eu já não gravo um react e tal? Porque muitas das vezes a gente vai comentar alguma coisa, vai falar alguma coisa, talvez agregue, não, não sei, né? Mas quero ver junto de vocês. Então vamos dar uma olhada a começar com o primeiro vídeo que eles postaram, tá? Esse vídeo é da IGN e vamos ver o que eles estão falando. Making games is really tough. Making open world games is really, really tough. And making Star Wars open world games is the next level of difficulty. Julian Garrity, creative director at Massive Entertainment, is up for a challenge. Man, for the first bonito, time ever, we're getting a fully open world Star Wars video game. It's been a long time coming, but after back-to-back -back successes with both The Division and The Division 2, Garrity was in the mood to take a risk. This may be just my approach, but even if it's scary, you've got to do it. You've got to lean into it. What's the downside to pitching a Star Wars game at Lucasfilm Games in George Lucas's old office? I mean, what's the downside to that? If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But you still have that experience. Fast forward several years after that meeting, and Massive Entertainment is less than two months away from releasing Star Wars Outlaws, a fully realized version of the original Man, pitch described in that office. An open world of dual ambitions. Maintain the cinematic legacy of the films and create immersive scoundrel gameplay that grants you the freedom of the galaxy. I think it's taken this long to get an open world Star Wars game because of how, excuse the pun, massive it is to build a game like this. There are only so many studios in the world who build games of this scale. The door is then open for Massive to come to us and say, this is what we're interested in doing. This is the type of game design and gameplay we want. This is what we're thinking about in terms of an archetype. Where does that fit? It's the outlaw play of fantasy and it's open world. Those were the two main pillars that we pitched. Why open world? Because the outlaw fantasy really needs that to live and breathe. It's a combination of, I think, our DNA as a studio, our background, when we think, okay, what, what do we have a lot of experience doing? What do we think we're good at? And this fantasy, the, the scoundrel in, in Star Wars, begs for freedom. Massive was fully confident in its abilities to create engaging open worlds. The Division offered a bullet-filled action playground, while last year's Avatar Frontiers of Pandora displayed an ability to work well within a Disney license by building a near-unmatched visual paradise. But Star Wars was the new challenge that this team yearned for. Of course, deciding what kind of experience would live inside a Star Wars open world was the first thing that had to be decided. We took a step back, of course, and thought, okay, Star Wars open world, what an opportunity. Uh, what does that naturally want to be? And it wants to be the full scale from the very small to the very big. Man. Sitting inside a cantina, playing sabak, being able to walk through the street, jump on your speeder, drive across the planet's surface, park literally your bike in your own ship, take off into space seamlessly. That vision of full scale helped secure a green light from Star Wars custodians, but getting Lucasfilm's blessing was just the key in the ignition. Translating the cinematic spectacle of the original Star Wars movie trilogy into an open world, set between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, two of the most iconic films of all time, was the actual challenge. One that Massive set out to address in every aspect of Outlaws, from the way it looks and sounds, to the type of action-adventure gameplay it supplies. Fire up the hyperdrive. The sort of cinematic ambition that we had was in presentation. So that doesn't mean cinematics necessarily. What I care the most about is the interactive part, right? What we did was take a lot of inspiration from the original trilogy, but with today's technology. So very similar to what Rogue One did, what its aim was to do was to replicate a lot of the the sort of filmic effects of 
those lenses of the 1970s. So you'll see barrel distortion on the sides, vignetting, film grain, chromatic aberration, and of course, all wrapped up in an ultra widescreen presentation. Que legal, It's cara. a key point for open world games at large, uh, but I, I think. Vocês viram aqui? Eles estão fazendo o jogo, né, com paleta de cor e efeitos na tela, como se realmente parecesse, né, um filme de Star Wars lá da década de 80 e tal. Eu achei isso bem legal, bem legal. Na moral, eu sei que muita gente comenta aqui no canal coisas do tipo, nossa, Kalil, eu tô mais hypado pra esse jogo do que Assassin's Creed Shadows e eu te entendo. Tá muito convidativo isso aqui, né? Mano, tá muito convidativo. Olha lá, ó, a paleta de cor que ele tava falando. Olha isso, cara. Olha lá, ó, replicar. Vamos ver de novo esse trechinho. A lot of the, the sort of filmic effects of those lenses of the 1970s. So you'll see barrel distortion on the sides, vignetting, film grain, chromatic aberration, and of course, all wrapped up in an ultra widescreen presentation. It's a key point for open world games at large, uh, but I, I think very much for Star Wars as well. And not always scale in that it needs to be grand, but it needs to be conscious. The scale of Tatooine needs and should and does in our game feel very different. It breeds you know, open sand dunes, long sight lines. You see it's easy to pick up any little anomaly on the horizon. There might be an opportunity for you compared to the dense streets of Kijimi. Scale is something written into the very DNA of Star Mano, Wars, é whether seen on the big or small screen. Greg Fraser, Rogue One's director of photography, recently told IGN that If you watch any Star Wars film, that's what it's all about. It's, you know, knowing how big a human is going into this massive Millennium Falcon. You know how big the Millennium Falcon is going to this massive Death Star. Like, you know, it's scale upon scale upon scale. It's a philosophy Geraghty and the team at Massive took into Outlaws when crafting the introduction to its open world. One of our intentions was for the beginning of the game to make it feel very small and then bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So beginning of the game, you start off in one room and it's claustrophobic and it's meant to make you feel a little bit trapped. You open up and it's city streets, but it's contained. Nossa, mano, olha isso aqui, velho. Narrative stuff and you steal a ship and you explode into the galaxy and all of a sudden you crash land on this planet, which is wide open world. That sort of sense of everything growing for you and not just the scale of the, the galaxy, but the, the scale of the possibilities for you as a character, as a rookie outlaw. Hey, Vess. The underworld's favorite new scoundrel. Outlaw's campaign tells the tale of K. Vess, a young scoundrel looking to build a team from across the stars in order to pull off one big space heist and remove the death mark placed on her by the Zeric Vesh crime syndicate. It's the basis of a story that evokes many other adventures from across both games and film. I love Mass Effect 2, it was one of, or is one of my favorite games. I think there were so many influences, everything from Ocean's 11, Ocean's 8, to Star Wars itself, you know, the, the previous films, like that heist feeling was always kind of in the fabric to just tonally films of Kurosawa, those original influences to George Lucas. Knowing what sort of story you want to tell is one thing. Telling an engaging story in an open world setting is another task altogether, and one that Kavari is well aware of, having written for Far Cry 4, 5 and 6, as well as The Division. It's one of the things you always have to keep in mind is how are we going to weave a narrative and an open world together so that we're telling the story but also giving you the freedom to sort of go wherever you like. We had a really clear approach on Outlaws, which was there was Kay's journey. We called them sort of lighthouses. There were key points that we knew we want her to hit these and then that makes her story kind of part of the wider Star Wars narrative. But between those moments, we knew early on that if you got distracted by curiosity, the world had to react to that. It had to expect that the player is going to go off the beaten path. The things that lie off the beaten Nossa, path are built in accordance to something Massive refers to as the three second rule, where within a few blinks of an eye, you can instantly understand the nature of a location or character and the story Nossa, behind them. Essa cena, tá ligado? Tipo, na hora que chega o transporte, ela começa a atirar 
E fica marcas nele, mano. The things that lie off the beaten path are built in accordance to something Massive refers to as the three second rule. Where within a few blinks of an eye, you can instantly understand. Olha isso aqui, cara. Nossa, tá muito bonito. Tá muito bonito. Stand the nature of a location or character and the story behind them. Before you even put life in them, they need to visually tell a story about what kind of place it is, what's happened in the past, what type of... Olha isso, cara. Life and events have taken place in them, so they get that lived-in feeling, and that lived-in, relatable, substantial feel. I think it's a hallmark of any good open world, but also very Star Wars. Star Wars aesthetic has always been rooted in the idea of the used future, where everything from the largest spaceships to the tiniest droids have that instantly recognizable layer of grime. Those small details build up into authentic, cool and bespoke spaces, something Massive has always managed to build into its open worlds. The Division and its sequel are packed full of memorable levels ranging from New York landmarks to Washington DC museums, and that philosophy is being transferred to Outlaw's many planets. Its main missions promise to take us to iconic locations such as Imperial bases and Jabba's Allah. Palace. We can lean into the virtual tourism aspect of, hey, what is the distance between the moisture farms and Mos Eisley uh, and the cantina? There is a linear roller coaster story, golden path, if you will. And around that, of course, there's the open world. That's the, the dream uh, I know I had as a kid. That is what I've always wanted from a Star Wars game is that you know, when I'm on a journey, when I'm entering into a quest, it might start on foot. It might start navigating a High Republic uh, cruiser that's crashed, but I want to be able to jump into my speeder and blast off, hop into the Trailblazer, take off into space, maybe land in a space station. Tudo isso você faz, mano. Ai, que louco. That factor into my quest or journey along the way. And so that sort of connective tissue of planet or moon to space was crucial because that's kind of the fantasy. Opa, peraí, peraí, peraí. Pera after... Olha lá, ó. Quando você chega, mano, olha que legal, né? Esses lugares, mano. Galera brigando ali, ó. Mas, ó, quando você chega no, no planeta, tem lugares específicos pra você descer, ó, eu acho. That fantasy and freedom is evidently at the core of Outlaws. And while all five planets and moons won't be instantly available to hyperdrive between, Geraghty claims it won't be long into Kay's journey until the galaxy opens up. There's a very structured intro that leads Aqui, ó, isso aqui que eu queria ver. Olha lá, ó, você chega num lugar, aí olha lá, ó. Mirogana City, Juntas Hope, Pike Potion Station. São lugares que você vai escolher e aí a nave vai descer. Mano, isso é tão legal. That fantasy and freedom is evidently at the core of Outlaws. And while all five planets and moons won't be instantly available to hyperdrive between, Geraghty claims it won't be long into Kay's journey until the galaxy opens up. There's a very structured intro that leads you to crash land on Tashara, which is a moon that we created with Lucasfilm Games. And once you finish the, the sort of linear narrative on Tashara, the other planets open up. And there it becomes completely non-linear and you can choose to tackle those in Ah, a... que legal. Então, ó, a história, pelo jeito, vai ser assim. Você vai começar ali preso em algum lugar, vai roubar uma nave, vai sair, alguma coisa vai acontecer com essa nave, você vai cair em Tashara. Aí lá vai ter uma história linear para você fazer e depois que você fizer essa história linear, aí todos os planetas se abrem e aí você faz o que você quiser. Puta, que da hora, velho. Exploration of these worlds is highly encouraged, with maps that are not, at least initially, flooded with icons. Opa, opa, mapa. Tatooine, ó o mapa de Tatooine. Lá em cima a gente tem veículo, veículos? Será que nós teremos mais que uma... Uma speeder, mais que uma nave, equipamentos, habilidade, mapa, journal, reputação e banco de dados. Olha aí, cara. Primeira vez que eu vejo essa tela, a tela do mapa, né, do mundo. And points of interest, because you're seeing these places from a fresh Olha perspective. Isso, Kay, as a character, hasn't seen the galaxy. So the first time Kay comes to Tushara is the first time you come to Tushara. And... It's not an unknown, uncharted place. So you'll have a map of where you can see, ah, oh, this 
the mountains over there and stuff, but discovery is what gives you more information. You're gonna have to take some risks. You're gonna have to go to a cantina and you can eavesdrop, pick up on some conversations that will lead you to another location that reveals a location within the open world that you have to get on your speeder to go uh, and find. There will be a fog of war that you'll be able to clear up and that's really where your curiosity will open things up even que legal. more. Each of Outlaw's worlds vary in size. Tashara, Massive's newly created moon, is around the same size as the jungle planet of Akiva, but a little smaller than the vast desert of Tatooine. It was less about how big, but more about how long in terms of traversal with the speeder it would be. Four or five minutes non-stop, which doesn't sound like a lot, but once you're committed, it's a fairly uh, large amount. You're always going to be distracted. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which was one of the, the games that we were looking at while creating this, you have different zones, so it's two or three of those together. And that doesn't even take into account the vast areas of space that surround each planet and serve as entirely different areas of orbital exploration and opportunity. We'll cover that, as well as the Starship side of the game, in greater depth later on in this month's IGN first. I said run. In terms of mission design, we've seen action ranging from stealth infiltrations, frantic dogfights, high-speed chases and intense blaster battles, with some quests even evolving to include all these elements at different stages. Star Wars Outlaws is thus perhaps better thought of as a single-player narrative action adventure in the wrappings of an open world, something more akin to Marvel's Spider-Man than dense RPGs like The Witcher or Ubisoft's recent Assassin's Creed games. Its mixture of popcorn action and blockbuster narrative ambition is a departure from Massive's gear-based experience on The Division. It's a new chapter in the continued evolution of a studio that started life as a real-time strategy developer. I think if you look at the, the evolution hora, of the open world between Division 1 and Division 2, there's a life, a dynamism, a systemic quality to Division 2 that we didn't have in Division 1. I'm not talking about the presentation, the soft values at all. I'm talking about pure gameplay experience, uh, single player or, or cooperative. That was very, very important to us to have as a living, breathing element that engages players while they're playing Outlaws. It's an evolution of what Massive has been doing in their games for years now, keeping worlds feeling bustling and alive even when set against post-apocalyptic backdrops or in the midst of galactic wars. We, in both Division games, but especially in the second one, developed what we call living world systems. So same thing here. We have systems that make sure that the world is always alive with movement, traffic, you know, speeders uh, sipping around, the empire patrolling, the syndicates have you know, footholds out there. Sometimes more substantial events happen. It's really up to you if you want to engage or not. Perhaps Outlaw's most interesting method of breathing life into its open world is its approach to character progression. There's no leveling up or incremental stat boost to drop experience points into. Instead, K's ability and equipment are linked to experts, people you'll meet across the galaxy who will grant you upgrades in exchange for work. I heard you're the best shot on the Como planet. Como é que é? K's ability and equipment As habilidades, equipamentos estão vinculados. Linked to experts, people. Ah, a pessoas experts, né, especialistas que a gente vai encontrar e vai decidir se vai fazer para ele as missões ou não, tá, OK. You'll meet across the galaxy who grant you upgrades in exchange for work. I heard you're the best shot on the planet. Oh, and you want to be second best. They are full on characters. You don't know exactly who they are, what exactly they have to offer you uh, and how to reach them from the very Nossa, beginning. So there's this journey of discovery here as well. Intel, clues, okay. I think there's a guy or gal or something <laughs> that can <clears throat> do good things to my speeder here. Meaning these are really strong incentives for you to move around and journey through the world and expose yourself to other fun things on the way. And once you reach them, there's a character there to interact with and an adventure to go on because they want instantly just, oh, here you go. Right? And then they essentially open up a little regional progression for you where 
the nature of unlocking those things is also very tangible. For example, after finding a Jawa by sourcing their location from overheard intel at a cantina, you can complete a mission for them in order to gain a new skill. In this case, it's to venture into a dead Sarlacc to find a pristine tooth from its second mouth, which you can then exchange for a laser turret for Kay's starship, the Trailblazer. It's a smart way of blending gameplay progression with the narrative befitting of the Star Wars criminal underbelly. You can go... Tipo, tá claro pra mim que esse jogo, a, a ideia né, dele é você não ruxar. É você explorar tudo que você puder, encontrar com pessoas e não passar batido. Tipo, se tiver a opção de conversar, conversa. Porque essa pessoa vai te mandar pra um lugar que chegando naquele lugar você vai ir pra outro lugar, vai abrir uma missão, vai conhecer outras tantas pessoas cumprir a missão e aí receber né, o loot desejado tal, ou coisas que você nem imaginava, né? Cara, gostei, gostei. É o tipo de coisa que eu gosto de fazer quando eu tô em live, principalmente, né? Quando a gente recebe um game muito em cima pra analisar, é cruel fazer esse tipo de coisa, porque a gente quer correr o mais rápido possível pra poder terminar e dar uma opinião mais é, completa, né? Só que convenhamos que ruxar não é a melhor maneira de você jogar um game de mundo aberto, principalmente assim, jogos assim, né? Que muita coisa depende de escolhas, e escolhas que estão lotadas no mundo inteiro. Detalhe, mais que um mundo aqui. Legal, cara, legal. Eu, 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 eu espero né, que esse jogo realmente seja tão bom como ele tá se vendendo né, nas ações publicitárias e... Tudo que a galera tá falando aqui. Ainda não pude testar o game, não tive nenhum teste do jogo nem nada. Mas eu tô louco pra pôr as mãos nele pra poder ver se é tudo isso mesmo. E poder trazer impressão pra vocês ou jogar com vocês, né? Em live, que eu acho que jogar em live esse game aqui vai ser o ó. Sabe aquelas lives de 10, 12 horas? Esse game tem conteúdo pra isso. Vai ser legal. On a journey with a character, such as uh, an expert who is going to teach Kay a new skill, a new, give her a new upgrade, you know, to her blaster. That skill, that upgrade definitely ties into Kay pulling off the heist, but it's also very much its own journey, which is in the Star Wars tradition as well. Another system aiming to marry gameplay with narrative is how Outlaws tracks Kay's reputation with each of the criminal syndicates. Her bond with each of the Huts, Pikes, Crimson Dawn and Ashiga clan will strengthen or weaken depending on your choices in dialogue and mission objectives. I'm gonna finish it. Shame. Your reputation moving in the positive direction unlocks a lot of things for you. Everything from actual ah, access to aí, that they control. Existem várias facções. E isso já não é novidade pra ninguém, né? Só que as missões que nós vamos fazer ali pode aborrecer ou não a facção. Eu acho que é tipo algo que a gente tem no, no Ronin, né? No jogo do Ronin, que a gente tem várias facções também e a gente pode agradar uma... Desa... Agradando uma pode acabar desagradando outra, coisa desse tipo. Legal, cara, se for isso mesmo. Where? You might have been able to sneak in otherwise to uh, landing pads in the open world. Discount with traders affiliated with the syndicate, unique, really exotic rewards, etc., etc. But if you, if you really get on their bad side, that's another thing that you will feel dynamically in the game because they actually send hit squads out for you in the open world. The reputation system doesn't just sit inside of missions, though. Smaller opportunities regularly present themselves to boost your relationships among the syndicates. These might be smaller skirmishes where choosing to get involved can benefit you and the organization you side with. And a strong bond may even help you out with the bigger threat looming over the galaxy. This is getting bad. Hold right. If you, for whatever reason, ended up wanted and you're being chased by Empire and you cross paths with a syndicate that you have really good reputation with at the moment, they might join in and help you out. Outlaws directly follows the legal. events of The Empire Strikes Back and sees the Imperial forces at the peak of their powers. In gameplay terms, the Stormtroopers are basically like GTA's police and adopt a similar wanted system. Find yourself in a restricted area or accidentally fire a stray laser bullet at a Stormtrooper and you'll quickly find yourself in hot water. Ah, olha aí, vocês viram aí? Os Stormtroopers eles vão ser tipo a polícia do GTA, mano. Vai ter um lance de perseguição, um nível de perseguição... Se você, sem querer, sair atirando a esmo dentro da cidade, você vai ser perseguido. Olha que legal. 
Eu não sabia disso não. Da hora. It's by no means a revolutionary system when it comes to open world design, but one that is made all the more exciting thanks to a lick of imperial black and white paint. It has a good range uh, of escalation and de-escalation. It's it's really up to you if you want to try and hide or maybe bribe an imperial officer that's a bit corrupt in the city somewhere or try to jump to a different space region. But you will feel it and let's just say there are death troopers for you. Hang on. Beyond the main missions, expert side missions, and the reputation system at the core of it all, many other stackable activities exist in Outlaw's open world. These range from quick contracts such as smuggling and stealing, gambling in Sabak, to playing asteroid filled arcade shooter games, and betting on Kanto Bites Fabio Racing. All of these activities bolt arcade Caramba, olha essas atividades. Sabak, many other stackable activities exist in Outlaw's open world. These range from quick contracts such as smuggling and stealing, gambling in Sabak, to Sabak. Sabak deve ser um tipo de jogo que nem a gente tem naquele das máquinas de Horizon ou o jogo lá do, do Valhalla, tá ligado? Um jogo dentro do jogo. Many other stackable activities exist in Outlaw's open world. These range from quick contracts such as smuggling and stealing, gambling in Sabak, to playing asteroid filled arcade shooter games and betting on Kanto Bites Fabio Racing. All of these activities bolster your ever growing supply of credits, which can be used to purchase new customization and gear options for Kay, her pet like alien companion Nyx, and the Trailblazer. And yet, there's more. Emergent events frequently take place throughout the open world whether on land or in space. Every two, three minutes, there'll be something that's happening, whether it's an ambush or the Empire arresting some civilians or combat with uh, some criminal syndicates, and it's up to you whether you want to engage or not. So with so much to do in Star Wars Outlaws, Caramba, how does Massive velho. go about avoiding open world bloat? With Vocês viram? A ideia é fazer um mundo vivo a ponto de, de dois a três minutos que você estiver jogando, alguma coisa vai estar tá acontecendo ao seu redor. Cabe a você entrar, interagir com isso ou não. Aconselho, interagir com tudo. Para abrir novas linhas de missões, desbloquear novas utilidades, sei lá, habilidades. Mano, tá alguém ali roubando alguém, vai lá, dá um cacete no cara. Tá vendo um monte de Stormtrooper acuando, alguém vai lá, bate nele, sei lá. Eu acho que, assim, é o tipo de jogo que eu acredito que jogando, né, eu vou estar tá fazendo tudo, cara, interagindo com tudo. Dá-se a entender que esse jogo, ele é extremamente grande. Eu só espero que esse inchaço de coisas, né, não prejudique, mas que sejam coisas que realmente venham a agregar ao gameplay, né? Que tenha uma historinha legal, por mais que sejam missões secundárias, muitas das vezes, mas que faça sentido e que agregue, como eu falei no gameplay, te dando roupas novas, habilidades novas, é, uma linha nova, né? De diálogo com personagens que vão passar a nos acompanhar a partir daquilo, sei lá. With a near endless galaxy of opportunity, there's the worry that things may spiral, feature creep sets in, and everything just gets Olha too isso. big. The studio had a clear plan from the start though, leading with variety over size, quality over quantity, if you will. We don't want things to be just big for our big sake. We need it to be contained, always fun, always proposing different activities. Oh, It's about Jimmy. calibrating size to substance. When you see something that breaks pattern, that stands out for that reason, you go there and look there's something there to do and that that repeats frequently enough and that Aí, cara. kind of content of the game makes use of it so that it doesn't feel like a separate experience but it, it's all one of course no matter how much they mano tá prometendo muito é, é foda mano é foda porque você começa a ver essas coisas você fica hypado mano você fala puta merda e se não for isso que esses caras estão falando mano depois a, a queda vai ser tão grande mas, mano, eles estão prometendo muita coisa, velho. É basicamente o jogo perfeito, né? Pelo que, se você tá prestando atenção aí na legenda e tal, eles estão prometendo o um jogo perfeito de mundo aberto. Cara, eu torço pra que seja parecido com isso. Não precisa nem ser perfeito. Mas se for metade do que eles estão falando aqui, tem tudo pra ser um jogão, cara. Um jogo não focado em grandiosidade, né? Em extensão. Né, você viu eles colocando ali, tem que ser coisas contidas e tal, mas robustas, cheia de, cheia de atividades interessantes, 
Você vai ver alguma coisa diferente no mapa? Vai lá, que alguma coisa vai ter. E vai ser algo legal. Olha, mano. Estão deixando a gente sonhar, né? A famosa frase. Bom, a real é que dentro de um mês a gente já vai saber como é que é, né? Will be to do it outlaws. One thing that can be expected is a healthy helping of nods to the larger Star Wars galaxy. Lando is set to make an appearance, and we've already seen a glimpse of Han Solo in Carbonite. Olha lá, ó, Han Solo lá mesmo, ó, o Lando ali. Wars galaxy. Lando is set to make an appearance, and we've already seen a glimpse of Han Solo in Carbonite. But it sounds like they might just be the tip of the iceberg. There's Easter eggs. There's characters that you'll meet along the way across the main quests. Tem que ter. Tem que ter. Experts or you know the wider stories you're gonna stumble across. August 30th is a really great date. I, I recommend uh, bookmarking it in your calendar. August 30 is right around the corner. A short wait for many players for whom an open world game set in a galaxy far, far away has been a long held dream. I could feel a similar passion for Star Wars coming out of each person I spoke to at Massive. And for them, I can't help but get the sense that that dream is a shared one. Making open world games is tough, and bringing open world to Star Wars may well bring an extra level of difficulty. But for Garrity and the team, it's been a challenge worth taking on. I'm not as young as you used to be, and I'm getting to that point where I think I can count the number of games I can do till I'm put out to pasture on, on one hand. And it becomes more and more important to me to choose what I do because it's really important for me to do quality work with people that I love working with. And uh, Star Wars is definitely bucket list. So where do we go next? Anywhere we want. We'll have more exclusive looks at Star Wars Outlaws for you throughout July. And for everything else, stick with IGN. Ah, Kalil, mas é Ubisoft. Ah, Kalil, mas não sei o quê. Mas seja sincero comigo. Dá uma vontadezinha de jogar, não dá não? Se... <risos> Estão vendendo muito bem esse peixe, cara. E hoje, eles lançaram outro vídeo. E é o que a gente vai ver agora. Star Wars Outlaws takes scoundrel Kay Vess on a planet hopping adventure as she goes in search of one big heist that will get her out of the trouble she finds herself in. Set between the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, the Imperial forces are at the peak of their powers and will naturally serve as an enemy faction. But more integral to the Outlaws experience are the crime syndicates that Kay will encounter and the scum and villainy that comes with them. Dotted throughout the galaxy, each has its own story to tell and, more importantly, can be used to Kay's benefit when you see fit thanks to Outlaw's reputation system. Across all of them, there's fierce rivalries that Kay is going to have to navigate and the player is going to have to engage with the reputation system in order to get what she wants. You're not friends, you're not employed, you're not pledging allegiance. You're someone surviving and trying to grow a name, reputation in this world and think of them as a little bit of means to an end. What do they have to offer and what do I need and want right now? We've delved deeper into the gameplay impact of the reputation system and how you can manipulate the syndicates earlier in this month's Star Wars Outlaws IGM first. But who are these syndicates? We talk to members of the development team at Massive Entertainment to learn about the visual design of each and their place in the world of Star Wars Outlaws. Let's jump! Oh, o cartel do Hutch, ó. Perhaps the most well-known of the Star Wars criminal syndicates, the Huts are led by everybody's favorite giant slugman, Jabba the Hutt. Flanked by Bib Fortuna, Salacious Crumb, and other hilariously named cronies, they first appeared in 1983's Return of the Jedi as the crime lords of Tatooine. Straightforward and not afraid to dispatch with anyone who plays games with them, they love galactic credits and the power they bring. The idea with the Huts is really what you see is what you get, right? They aren't afraid to use force, they take what they want, and they are just incredibly powerful. 
Jabba the Hutt, very famous character in the Star Wars galaxy. And so uh, the Hutt Syndicate is definitely inspired by that. So you will see forcers and you will see characters that you know from the movies as well, Gamorrean guards, for example. But their look is definitely Tatooine inspired. I think it's interesting to say that the Hutts have probably the most dirt and wear and tear on their clothing of all the syndicates. You will find them on different locations as well. All the syndicates, you know, they have power that goes beyond the planet where they're from. The Pike Syndicate will be a recognisable name to anyone who watched The Book of Boba Fett or Star Wars The Clone Wars TV series, but don't expect them to look exactly how you remember. They have a very distinctive look. They are pikes, but they're different from the pikes you've seen in uh, different shows, for example, because it's a different group. So in their design, we really went into a different direction with color palettes, so they have a lot more dark blues, but also we went really into more of a graphic design for them. So you will see the helmets they wear and the clothing they wear they have different patterns which will show which rank they are or like which group they belong to so they will be very distinctive in that sense as well they're not as organized i would say as a military group but they do have different units uh, that have different weapons for example different skills and you will see a distinction in that through spice production and trading, the Pikes amassed a fortune from their homeworld of Obadiah. But by the time of Outlaws, the Syndicate finds itself spread out throughout the galaxy, including an operation on the freshly created moon of Tashara. The Pike Syndicate is incredibly wealthy and powerful in this time period, and we sort of center around their underboss, Gorak, who is very much in charge of Pike operations on the moon of Tashara. Tashara is under imperial control just like the rest of the galaxy we get to see the corrupt side of that because the pikes have worked out a deal with the empire there where they they get to do what they need to do and the empire always gets its cut Fueled by an unrelenting desire to turn profits, no matter what moral lines may need to be crossed, the Pike's love of luxury and all things shiny is best demonstrated in the appearance of Gorak. We really wanted chic. him to look very much like the boss, so he's much bigger than the regular Pike characters that you will meet. He's definitely not the one who fights, he's the, he's the one who tells people what to do. He has also a lot of jewelry, he's very rich. We really wanted to tell a story, you definitely see Gorak is the leader. Tell the governor the payments will not increase. As more Star Wars stories are written, the more important Crimson Dawn's influence in the galaxy appears to grow. Led by Lady Kira, Amelia Clarke's character from Solo, a Star Wars story, Crimson Dawn is the syndicate responsible for auctioning off Han Solo's frozen carbonite wall decoration in the comic books, a prize won by Jabba and the Hutts, who outbid the Pike Syndicate. A mysterious organization operating in the shadows of power, many of Crimson Dawn's intentions remain shrouded when it comes to Outlaw's story. This is a restricted area. You need to back away right now. Fine, I hear you. Narrative director Naveed Kavari gives us some hints, however, noting that the syndicate is really focused on intelligence spreading and aligning a bit of the wider network of organized criminals. Crimson Dawn, especially if you look at some of the, the wider media, is up to something very, very interesting that I'll, I'll leave to, to others to explore and, and dive into, but this period is very, very important in terms of the character Kira. The shadowy nature of the group is reflected in their visual design, allowing them to blend into any location they might find themselves in, but also place their stamp when they want to make their presence known. You will be able to meet them in certain places, and it's not always necessarily a place that's entirely theirs maybe they took over some place so we try to really show that layer of okay crimson dawn took over this place now you can see certain elements of them on top of something that used to be something else they are more fashionable i would say compared to the other syndicates and we try to translate that as well in their clothing but they're also very undercover in the shadows you would not see them if they would stand somewhere in the corner and just observing things so their clothing is very practical but very clean as well cleaner than any of the other syndicates really to show that they have access to better materials and it's maybe also part of their style.
The Ashiga clan is a new syndicate created by Massive in collaboration with Lucasfilm, and can be found on the freezing planet of Kajimi, one of five playable planets and moons in Star Wars Outlaws and last seen in The Rise of Skywalker. Although brand new when it comes to Star Wars canon, those more knowledgeable about the galaxy far, far away might be familiar with the alien species they hail from. They're completely new, but... Cara, os mundos parecem tão diferentes e tão ricos, né? Legal. We did use an existing species called the Melito for the Ashika clan, and there's many different aspects on them. First thing on the Melito is that they don't have vision, they don't have eyes, so they use different senses. And that was really interesting to design, like a whole syndicate that doesn't use eyesight. So all of their designs have a lot of tactile elements. They're based on Kijimi. In the areas they control, you can see these lines on the floor. That's sort of their way of navigating. Olha que legal, mano. Nossa, muito criativo. <risos> Lucas, né? É, esse sindicato, eles não enxergam, eles não têm olhos. Então, eles se movimentam ali em outro, por, conta, por conta do tato, tal, né? audição. E olha como que eles se localizam na cidade através desses lances no chão, ó. Que mostra onde eles devem ir e tal. Olha que legal, cara! feeling around almost where to go. Their style really connected to Kajimi City. We wanted to show that they've been there for a long time, so the city itself influenced their look as well. And as Kajimi City is, is heavily inspired by samurai movies and it has a lot of these Japanese influences, we use the same sources of inspiration for the Shiga clan as well. And you will see that in their silhouettes that have a lot of uh, references to samurai armor or kimono type of clothing. The insect-like nature of the Melito race not only provided some interesting visual challenges for the team, but also influenced how the syndicate is structured and what its goals include. Whereas others such as the Pikes, Huts and Crimson Dawn value money, power and information as ways to grow their influence, the Ashiga clan is much more focused on itself and its small pocket of the galaxy. Our expansion has made us vulnerable, Mother. It will make the hive stronger. The Shiga clan are really interesting because they follow this very strict hierarchical structure. They are made up of a insect-like species that every single member of the Shiga clan is serving the wider group uh, under the control of Queen Ashiga more than any other syndicate where you might have some characters, some subordinates, you know, off to their own devices. In the Ashiga, it's they are serving the queen and that's it. And that gave a really fascinating dynamic. They have a strict code of honor. They're very like a hive mind. And they have one very powerful queen who is in charge. So there's definitely references to that as well in the way they organize their locations, for example, which will remind a little bit more of an ant hill. A Shiga clan is really trying to keep the control over Kajimi, which is a very important city, and trying to, to really get their uh, revenue through that. They're also a syndicate that you will maybe encounter less on different locations because they are so connected to the city. So it's really their power over the city is what gives them their meaning. We have decided. Sitting outside of the reputation system is the Zeric Besh, a mysterious syndicate that serves as Outlaw's primary antagonist. Where you'll be able to interact with the other four crime gangs and forge and break bonds of your choosing as the story progresses, the Zeric Besh serves more as a distant looming threat. They are run by Slero, a man who has placed a death mark on Kay at the beginning of her story, forcing her to go on the run. It's an incredibly oh, yeah. wealthy organization. They have their own plans and are, are more of a new player to the galaxy and to the syndicates. We very much wanted to treat them like they're the new player on the block. So for Kay, she's really on the run from them and from Slero. So they, they are actively hunting her down. She's using the other syndicates to kind of get what she needs to pull off a heist that's going to secure her freedom from them. A deadly group not to be messed with, the Zeric Besh needed an ominous appearance to match, something that Yonkers and the team have worked hard on. I mean, they look very threatening. That's uh, definitely one of the starting points for their design. So we really wanted an imposing silhouette. For them, they really, we really looked at the silhouette as well. So they have very heavy silhouettes. You can see they're very heavy helmets. If you encounter them, you will be intimidated. You know, we wanted them to look intimidating. And they have big helmets not to get a bigger silhouette, but also it creates a bit of a distance between you and them. You don't know who's inside, you know? So that was really for us important thing that they would feel like, uh, yeah, you need to get out of their way if you ever encounter 
encountering him. Much about Sleero and his gang remains a mystery for now, with Massive reluctant to give away many more details about your encounters with them. We'll learn much more about them though, and why they're at the core of Kay's story when Star Wars Outlaws releases on August 30th. We'll have more exclusive looks at Star Wars Outlaws for you throughout July. É, aqui eles falam mais um pouco aí sobre a cobertura deles e tal, da Quaigene. Caramba, cara, é muita informação, né? Eu sei, eu sei, é muita informação, até pra eu mesmo aqui e tal. Mas, por enquanto, o que eu posso dizer pra vocês é que tudo, diz, tudo que eu tô vendo, né, tá sendo bem promissor. E realmente, né, promete ser aí, talvez, uma das melhores, se não a melhor experiência Star Wars que nós vamos ter em um videogame. Eu, embora não seja uma história Jedi, né, que a gente já teve tantos em videogame e tal, é uma outra perspectiva, mas que chama muito a atenção. Esse lance de sindicatos, de governos, de planetas diferentes, de você poder negociar, poder mudar a história, eu não sei, isso não foi falado em nenhum lugar, mas é possível até que esse game tenha aquele esquema de finais alternativos, né? Já que o game todo é lotado de escolhas, pessoas que você pode trair, ajudar, sindicatos que podem ir com a sua cara, né, ou não, mediante a reputação que você tiver, cara, é um negócio muito louco, muito grande, e eu repito, né, estão deixando a gente sonhar, eu não sei se o jogo realmente vai ser tudo isso que eles estão vendendo, mas tá muito convidativo, tá muito convidativo, e me mandaram uma matéria, para fechar, falando um pouco sobre o, o tamanho do mapa. E aí eu não sei se é mapa de um mundo ou do mundo todo. Vamos dar uma olhada. Ó, saca só, da Adrenaline. Outlaws não entregará mapa cheio de marcações. Aleluia! Puta merda, mano. A Ubisoft tá começando a fazer o que a gente quer, né? Nesse quesito de, de mapa, mano. Kay, a protagonista de Star Wars Outlaws, terá que desbravar a galáxia para ter seu mapa completo com marcações. Se tem uma coisa que virou até meme, <risos> é a Ubisoftalização dos jogos. Star Wars Outlaws, o um jogo da Ubisoft, deve ter menos desse aspecto conhecido do estúdio, que são mapas cheios de indicadores sobre o que fazer e aonde ir, segundo o diretor Matias Carlson na entrevista com a IGN. O motivo disso não acontecer é porque Kay, a protagonista do jogo, não conhece a galáxia. Por isso, ela não teria um mapa já completo cheio de marcações que facilitariam a vida do jogador. Abre aspas. Kay não viu a galáxia, ela não sabe tudo. A primeira vez que você for a Toshara, você terá um mapa com o qual poderá ver as montanhas e outras coisas. Mas a descoberta é o que lhe dará mais informações. Legal. Star Wars Outlaws convida o jogador à exploração. Mesmo jogos da Ubisoft com esse aspecto forte, como o Assassin's Creed Far Cry, também não entregam o mapa já completo. É preciso explorar e abrir as regiões escalando torres, por exemplo, para então ter todos os pontos de interesse disponíveis. Mas em Star Wars Outlaws, o diretor criativo Julian afirma que o jogador terá que correr alguns riscos. Será necessário bisbilhotar conversas para saber sobre locais e assim explorar para descobrir ainda mais coisas. Abre aspas. Você terá que ir numa cantina e poderá escutar e captar algumas conversas que o levarão a outro local que revela um lugar... É o que a gente viu no vídeo agora há pouco, né? Uh, de mundo aberto que você deve acessar no seu speeder e tal. Haverá uma névoa de guerra que você poderá dissipar e aí que a sua curiosidade abrirá ainda mais coisas. É o que a gente viu no vídeo. Em abril, a Ubisoft chegou a afirmar ao Game Informer que o jogo não teria as tradicionais torres para serem escaladas para abrir mais no mapa, já que o jogador terá que explorar para que isso aconteça, ou seja, mais um esforço desse aspecto nessa nova entrevista com a IGN. É, Gary fala também do tamanho esperado para os planetas. Hum, na verdade, para ele, não se trata do quão grande, mas sim de quanto tempo seria em termos de travessia no speeder. A gente viu isso... Ah, eu acho que eles pegaram basicamente o vídeo, né? E trouxeram para cá. A Lua Toshara, que é do tamanho entre duas ou três zonas do mapa de Assassin's Creed Odyssey, pode ser totalmente percorrida em até cinco minutos com o speeder, o que não chega a ser pouco considerando a velocidade do speeder. Em Star Wars Outlaw, chega, tal, pipipi, popopó. Galera, é isso. 
Star Wars Outlaws tá chegando. Eu acho de verdade mesmo que o jogo ele pode ser né, algo muito bom, pode ser algo muito bacana, mas se não for isso que eles estão falando, vai ser algo muito difícil também para o estúdio, principalmente. Porque é um nome grande, né? Avatar é um nome grandíssimo e não deu tão bom, não, não deu tão bem, né? A gente sabe que muita gente, eu mesmo nem zerei, cara, tipo, não consegui avançar, não, não foi, sabe? Não, não foi. Vamos ver como é que vai ser isso aqui, que é a Disney, né? que é Star Wars, uma franquia ainda mais cabeluda. Eu tô torcendo pra que dê bom, né? Tudo tá me parecendo legal. Se realmente no gameplay, na pegada, for como eles estão falando, vai ser muito legal de jogar. Eu gostaria de saber a sua opinião a respeito do game, o que, que você acha. Deu bom? Não deu? Olha, mano, o hype tá subindo. Espero, né, e torço pra não me decepcionar. A real é que dia 30, né, pouco mais que um mês, a gente vai ter o jogo em mão para saber como é que ele é. Você vai assistir o conteúdo, as coisas que a gente vai postar aqui, não vai, tem interesse, não tem. É um jogo que você tá de olho, não é? Comenta para que eu possa saber, tá bom? Beijo no coração, sucesso, até a próxima, valeu!